like uh, when a lot of difficulties happen, uh, how a child comes running to a father, right? we are we are able to do that, right? And uh, as uh, brother was saying, that it's no longer uh, it's no longer that we don't have a person to go and cry to. Uh, through Jesus, we have access to the Father, and uh, may God help us to tap into this. I was just looking at I was somehow touching my my thoughts that word that uh, help us to always drink from you Lord help us to always drink from you and never uh, never let us go away and you know drink water from places that we shouldn't um, uh, you know and uh, may God help us to tap into God uh, when we are in trouble God will definitely hear our prayers and uh, uh, I have we have seen that in this cell group. We uh, not not because any of us are special. I just believe that God has a lot of mercy on all of us. And uh, uh, help may God help us to tap into that. Um, I have shared this once. I want to share it again. The Bible says that His mercies are new every morning, and that's because we need new mercies every morning also. Right? It's like yesterday's mercy. God forgive me. God healed me. But tomorrow, I will need new mercy for sure. Right. And thank God that tomorrow morning His mercies are new and that we can expect that, we can believe in that. And that is the tone that I want to set uh, for this final message on the book of John. And that is uh, John chapter 21. Uh, can we all take that chapter? And uh, I, I, I'm in no rush. I, we may not be completing it today, uh, but I'll not cross the time. Right. So uh, if we don't complete it, uh, we'll do it next week. But uh, John chapter 21 is the chapter that we should look at and uh, can somebody read uh, John chapter 20 and verse 30 and 31 and then another person can read John 21 verse 1 So uh, you read that, right? So what what does it say? It says that Jesus performed many other miracles, but it's not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe, and by believing you may have life in His name, right? Does it sound to you like a logical end to a book? Right? Does it look to you like John has finished writing something, right? So um, okay, now somebody else can read John twenty one verse one. After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples of the sea of Tiberias. And on this wise showed he himself. Yeah. Uh, just, just a little bit more you can read. Till, uh, till, they were uh, together Simon Peter and Thomas called Didymus and Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, and the son of Zebedee and two others of his disciples. Simon Peter said unto them, I go a fishing. They say unto him, We also go with thee. They went forth and entered into a ship immediately, and that night they caught nothing. Thank you. So now here is uh, the story, right? John, the John wrote a wonderful gospel, and if you read John's gospel, uh, people divide John's gospel into three parts, right? And they, uh, John's gospel is not written like Luke wrote his gospel. It's not written like Mark wrote his gospel. It's not written like Matthew. The difference between Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is uh, Matthew was a what was Matthew's profession? Tax collector, right? So Matthew uh, was very interested about you know accounting things from the Old Testament. He he is the one who maximum wrote as it was written in the Old Testament. It happened in the New Testament. So Matthew took a lot of pain for that. Mark was the first uh, the first gospel that was written, and Mark was written uh, like scribed out by mark what uh, in that mark fashion who who told it to mark peter right always jumping the gun very fast short gospel only the important things everything finished in 16 chapters it is done right so that is mark right luke what was luke's profession luke was a doctor right and doctors like to take history right so luke luke wrote I am going to write to you, Luke's uh, initial letter was, Luke said, many people have written many things, 
but I want to write to you an orderly account. This happened first, then this happened, then this happened. So Bible scholars study Luke to get the uh, pattern, to get the consequence events, right? So John, on the other hand, wrote, did not write for any of these reasons, right? John did not write the gospel to record Jesus' life. He did not write the gospel to prove the Old Testament. He has very less sayings in the Old Testament. John wrote the book to show that Jesus was God. Jesus is God, right? That is how he begins and that is how he ended at verse, at chapter 20, end of chapter 20, he says that this is written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God. And by believing in that, that you may have life in his name, right? That is the, we have kind of completed uh, such wonderful miracles of Christ, right? Which nowhere else written in, in the Gospels. John speaks about water turning into wine that nobody writes about. John speaks about Jesus, you know, Jesus' high priestly prayer. He speaks about uh, the Samaritan woman. He speaks about, you know, a lot of things which nowhere else uh, in the Gospels it is written that Jesus did these things. So when John finishes uh, his Gospel, he finishes it almost, uh, you know, in a, as a, talking about Jesus, he finishes it there. And then almost like a part two, almost like a second uh, epilogue you know epilogue uh, what is epilogue epilogue is like after a book is finished it's like a ending notes closing remarks he again opens up and he writes there are many people who actually studied if john 21 was added by somebody else uh, but it is proven that john himself wrote this it was don't let anybody convince you that it was added by somebody it is proven that the earliest gospel of john had this chapter now in the book of john who are the disciples that are mentioned by name? Who are they? Peter is mentioned. Thomas is only mentioned specifically in the book of John. Did you know that the story of Nathaniel, how was Nathaniel called? Yeah. That Nathaniel was called uh, as, you know, he, he has a no, no deceit. All these specific men, sons of Zebedee are James and John, that is John himself. And then the other two disciples he does not name here. So he says, these people who I mentioned, who Peter, Nathaniel, Thomas, and me and my brother, and two others, were all sitting here after seeing all these great miracles. And then, what is their response? We are discussing, we were studying the last entire weeks about our response to the resurrection of Christ. Our response, our mandate of the resurrection. What was that? The mandate to the apostles was to go and preach forgiveness, to go and do, go and you know convert and make disciples. Now what do the disciples do after all these things were told to them and after Jesus proved to them that they are, he is the Messiah? What do they do? Peter said, yeah. Peter said, I'm going to fish. right? And all these guys said, we'll go with you. right? It's almost as if even though they are blaming Peter, Peter was the only guy who had an idea. right? Everybody else was sitting there, you know, scratching their head. And like Peter said, you know, if you're all sitting like this, I'm going to go and fish. right? So and they all went behind. Today we're going to talk about a very important topic and that is called Perseverance of the Saints. How many of you have heard this statement, Perseverance of the Saints, somewhere? Right, those who know Calvinism, those who have heard about Reformed faith will know Perseverance of the Saints is one of the tenets of Reformed theology. What they believe is, there is a church that believes, Sarah, can you stop that? Okay, sit there. There is a, there's a church that believes that once saved, you are always saved okay it's a little bit of brethren and a little bit of those background people they believe this that once you are saved you are always saved and how they counter this statement is now we can talk to them and say hey brother but how about this pastor who fell how about that person who went their reply to that is they he say was, he was never saved. those people were never saved right so if you are truly saved you are always yes. saved and this is the concept of persons of the saints which the brethren church teaches and we don't believe in that we believe that while jesus holds us in the palm of his hands it is not by our might that we stand it is him who carries us there is also a very important aspect called persevering in christ persevering in christ i want to talk to you very simple things this evening nothing much i can take but just a couple of things uh, in hebrews and how uh, the writer writes about persevering in our calling okay so 
what is the root uh, reason or what is the, uh, the the reason why many theologians or reformed theologians say that once you are saved you are always saved the verse that they pick up for this we'll read that john chapter 10 can we just read quickly john chapter 10 and verse 27 uh, uh, onwards okay can, yeah. mm. is it okay if i go ahead go ahead kj is fine my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. Mm. And I give unto them eternal life and they shall never perish. Mm. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. Thank you. And so this is the verse that this, this theology is based on. That means Jesus tells uh, as a response to some Jews, uh, he says to them that my sheep hear my voice. And if my sheep hear my voice, they come to me. And Jesus says that whoever comes to me, no one can snatch them out of my hand. And so that means, and he also says, I give unto them eternal life. What is the meaning of eternal life? Eternal life by definition means it can never perish. Right? Once Jesus gives me eternal life, can my life die? This is, this, these are all the arguments that are made for once saved, always saved. That means Jesus gave you the gift of eternal life. And so you are always saved. The, and if you now fall away, this verse of Christ is getting negated. Yes or no? You can't think like that. right? So now here is Christ telling the statement. And here is the basis on which a lot of unfortunate teachings are coming in the church. right? That once you are saved, you are always saved and, and, and so forth. Now, um, what is the context of this statement of Christ? Okay. The context, if you read a little earlier, we can't, we can, you can read that later at home. You can note down the verses if you want. But the Jews comes, a few Jews, uh, they are, John writes that when, when John chapter 10 is being written, Jesus already spent almost three years. Okay, it's almost the end of his public ministry. And at John chapter 10, it's almost coming to a climax there. So now at the feast of dedication, Jesus was walking in the temple and he was, he, uh, the, John writes that he was simply walking. Okay, he was not doing anything. He was just taking a stroll in the temple around. And whenever these Pharisees see this mighty prophet walking around, they are getting triggered. Why? Because now I can't. They can't preach. They 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 are not. They are feeling insecure about you know. Are we doing the wrong thing or is he looking at me this that? So finally they go and ask him, How long will you keep me in suspense? How long will you not tell me the truth? Tell me if you are the Messiah. That is the statement that they go and make. Okay. Now Jesus tells them very clearly, he tells them, can you sit down please, okay. sit down, he tells them, um, he tells them, I have already told you I am the Messiah, but you don't believe me, why don't you believe me, and then he says, my sheep hear my voice, and those who have heard my voice, those who have acknowledged me as the Messiah, such people, the, no one can snatch them from my hand, right? What is the essence of Christ's statement here? If you want to understand that, you want to understand, it's, it's like Jesus taking a focus light, you know, this uh, stage light, focus light. He is taking the focus light from somewhere and putting it somewhere else. Where is it originally? What was the, the meaning of the word Messiah for these Jews? What is the meaning of the word Messiah for these Jews? It was a prophet or rather a warrior, a king prophet, priest. You know, a king, prophet, priest who is powerful, who is uh, mighty, who is holy, who is everything. He will come one day and he will ascend on the throne of David and he will take back what? The nation of Israel from the Roman Empire, from the people who are. So he will, he will take back a kingdom that was snatched away from the Israelites. The power that was snatched away, the throne that was snatched away, all these you know, beautiful temples that were gone and all the Israelite kingdoms whose borders were snatched away. There is going to be a Messiah that will come and who will restore the kingdom for Israel. This is what they are focusing on. When they think of Messiah, they are thinking of political power. They are thinking of freedom of religion. They are thinking of freedom to vote. The Lord of these practical things are what they are thinking about. And then they say, tell us, when will you do this? It's been three years. You are healing. You are raising the dead. You are doing this and that. But when are you going to do what we are waiting for you to do? This is their suspense. That is, how long will you hold me in suspense? 
you know go and tell me if you are the messiah let's let's start the revolution that we have been waiting for so now the jesus takes that thing and says i already told you i am the messiah but you don't believe me because your mind is always about this kingdom kingdom messiah but there are some people who believe me who know i am the messiah i am not here to save a kingdom for them i am here to bring the kingdom into their hearts right that is a focus get shifted from external to an internal kingdom that's what christ taught us to pray may your kingdom come where where in my heart in my life in my thoughts in my emotions lord may your kingdom come this is when jesus becomes strictly personal to us he becomes a he becomes my personal savior he is not a political messiah savior he is not somebody who will do something for me externally but he is somebody whom i am accountable to because he saved my soul such people jesus says no one can snatch them from my hand that means i am truly the messiah as the as this, uh, david prophesied that he will sit on my throne and he will restore the kingdom where is the kingdom going to be restored where is the restoration happening in our hearts right we are going to be forever jesus we we are forever going to belong to jesus and no one is no roman empire no assyrian empire no babylonian empire no one can snatch them because they forever belong to me can can bjp snatch god's kingdom from my heart can any king can any president can any persecution ever take away god's kingdom from my heart no because i have been christ and he is mine as paul says what can separate me from the love of christ can famine or hunger or distress or disease nothing can separate me because his love has saved me right that is the perseverance that christ is talking about that is a person who has truly understood that i am accountable to christ i am his and he is mine right and now does this perseverance mean that we are off hands that there is no mandate for us that there is no uh, there is no uh, what is that called um, cautiousness or carefulness that we have to have in our life let's look at how hebrews the author of hebrews talks about perseverance now uh, there is a story that happened here let me before we go there i want to tell you the story that happened here is in john chapter 21 thank god that john did not end the gospel with how did he end uh, john chapter 20 jesus died and he rose again and he did all the miracles and he told thomas that touch my hands touch my body and i am the living god and thomas worships him a glorious end to jesus ministry is what he showed now thank god he didn't stop there he said these guys who saw this they did something what did they do they fell away they couldn't persevere they didn't they didn't they didn't they didn't uh, in the sense disown jesus but they were at the risk of falling away because they were as jesus told about the parable of the sower when the thorns of the world when the cares of the world came the thorns were begin beginning to press on peter they were beginning to press on john and these thorns were kind of crushing their faith and they decided to go back to fish and the story you all know the story i hope if you don't know the story you can read it it's a very very simple story where jesus goes back to them and he tells them what what does he do how does he how does uh, god make sure that we persevere too quick uh, you know from that story we can understand first thing is he withheld something from them what did he withhold what did he withhold their ex their expert fishermen before long before christ came they were fishing right so what happened that night they couldn't catch anything right so in times where god wants to restore us in times where god wants to come back and hit us where we can hear where we can listen is god will take away something that you take for granted right god will take away something that you think you will never fall here i can never fall in this area it is this is my expertise this is my cup of tea right i am somebody who preaches i am somebody who leads worship i am i am born in a good family i am i am counseling so many people i am doing so many things i i'll not fall for this right and jesus came and took away that 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 very thing that peter took for granted that is his, his fishing expertise and the morning early in the morning when peter and james and john were totally out of it he goes and says have you caught anything do you have any fish right 
and so there is a season of withholding there is a season of complete despair where you go behind every answer you can find you go behind every solution you can think of and nothing seems to work nothing seems to 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 work out even though you have seen it work in your life many times before maybe john is telling hey you know remember that day we caught the fish like this maybe you do this way all night all night they tried they couldn't catch anything jesus told the fish stay there don't move these guys are putting the fish putting the net he told them to stay just like he calmed the storm many many years back he calmed the fish and told them he was almost like he was playing a video game like tetris you have heard you know it's like christ is saying the tent is going there go here don't go to the net right and finally jesus comes and tells comes and tells us what are you crying about have you caught anything and they said no and then he says cast your net on the side of the boat and you will catch you know what the moment this happened john the the person who's writing this book john immediately tells peter it is the lord right that is god calls us in moments where we have taken something for granted and we lost we have lost our way we have fallen sick we have lost our jobs we have lost our peace the person that we thought we can count on that person will never leave me he is the one who is going to be there for me she is the one who is going to complete me when that person breaks our heart when that promise is broken then christ says now i will tell you right there is an answer there is a there is a restoration thank god there is a restoration that god has for us and he just said cast your net on this side of the fish and i want to tell you this evening i am rushing a little bit because i want to take my sweet time but i know that time is lacking but i want to share this quickly with all of you please bear with me i'll give the context later but as a quick application it is when jesus said cast your net on this side of this of the sea what that spoke to me very clearly you know it is for all the problems we are facing for all the lack of answers we are facing if it was god who withheld the answer god will give the answer i believe that if it was god who withheld that blessing if it was jesus who withheld that blessing from us when it is time in the morning when jesus comes he will give it to us he does not discipline us to kill us the prophet isaiah says a bruised reed he will not a bruised reed what is a reed a reed is a very thin plant right and when a, when a reed gets bruised what happens there's a small break and it starts to like almost fall and typical people who walk by it what do we do we just break it and take it in our hand right and the prophet isaiah says a bruised reed he will not break and a smoldering wick what's a smoldering wick a candle you have seen right a candle with just a smoke is coming a very it's like you know the the fire is almost going out and the prophet says a smoldering wick he will not snuff out but the work of christ is always to bring us back it is always to restore us it is never to destroy us it is never to it is never to completely crush us but every time god withholds a blessing every time god withholds something from us it is never to completely destroy or completely you know abandon us it is so that we may hear that voice and like that apostle john thank god there are some people in our lives who says that is the lord right he has answered our prayers he has given it back and the moment peter understood it is the lord what did he do what did he do he was naked they were fishing he was probably wearing only his undergarments he just put his robe tightened it because he was ashamed of what he was and he jumped in the water you know why he jumped in the water he wants he forgot everything he just wants to reach jesus and see again just like he ran towards the tomb just like he did all those walking on the water all the stuff he did before comes back to him like a storm and he jumps into the water and runs towards jesus you know I love that scene so much. I love that scene because you know my life is like that. Right? I I can't hold on to sin for more than a few minutes. I can't. I you know if I sin, I fall, but the moment I come to know, hey, I did something wrong, right? How many of us how many of you I can encourage that when you get the notion of sin, don't hold it, right? Don't hold, don't wait. don't wait for an opportune time to to confess don't wait for the next year or 6 months later don't say only if jesus does this for me i will don't do that before all that happens you know before they counted the fish before they they even took the fish abroad 
Jesus, uh, Peter took and he jumped, right? And he went towards Jesus. And so he was proclaiming his love for Christ more than everybody else. He was proclaiming his love for Christ more than James, John and others. He was proclaiming his love for Christ more than his boat, more than the nets. And that is why Jesus, when he comes and sits, what did he ask him? Do you truly love me more than these? Do you truly love me more than these things? Because Peter was showing always, he, you know, repeatedly in John's gospel, Peter keeps saying that, what? Even if everybody betrays you, I will not betray you. You can wash everyone's feet, but you will not touch my feet because I, you cannot touch my feet, right? If you are walking on water, I can also walk on water. And this, this, this desire of Peter is so beautiful, right? I, I hope that we all can have that. Being crazy for God, like not worrying about people's opinion about me because they all disciples will be like hey this is the guy who called us to fish now look at this guy jumping back and going as if he's he just pet right now now i am suddenly he doesn't care about he just jumped and he went right and jesus asked him do you truly love me more than and then he reinstates peter right there's a lot to say in that but there are some people who say the meaning of the word love that is used there three times is different and all that we can go through that in a much deeper way but very simply it was three times jesus asking him do you love me more than these? Do you love me more than these? And what is the the response of Peter? What's the response? Yes. Yes. Yes, Lord. Does he say I love you? No. You know. He says you know everything. Right? That is that Psalms 139 knowledge. I mean if you know that Psalms. Lord, you have searched me and you have known me. You know, before a word is on my mouth, you know me, Lord. Before, a, before an action is on my, you know, how much comfort I have in that. Because I know that last week I did all these wrong things. But when Jesus loved me the week before, he already knew all that. Right? When Jesus loved me, when he gave, died for me, when he gave his last blood for me, when he made me worthy of his calling and to be part of this fellowship and to do all of this when he made us worthy to sit with the word of God he already knew before a word is on my mouth he knew it before every thought he knew it and still he loved me right and that knowledge is what Peter is claiming Peter is saying Lord you are seeing all this I did you are seeing all my failures but you also know I love you right you also know that I have put my refuge in you such people is what Jesus said no one can snatch them from my Right? That innermost assurance of salvation. That Lord, I have faltered, I have failed. But I love you Lord and you know that. And that, that deep knowledge was there in Peter. And Peter says you know. And then there is a commissioning given to Peter. A commissioning is a responsibility given to Peter. What did he say? That you? What did he say? You feed my sheep. Are you all with me? You feed my sheep. And what is, what is the meaning of feeding my sheep? What is the meaning? Huh? To teach them? What is the meaning of feeding my sheep? It is to give his life. As, God, as Jesus gave his life. And so Peter asks him, Lord, what about John? You know, Jesus, Peter said, follow, Jesus told him, follow me. And he says, when you are young, you, you failed, you falled away. You were, you were not persevering. You were not, you were not able to follow after me. But when you are older, somebody will take you by the hand. They will torture you. They will take you where you don't want to go. Yet you will stand because I have, I am prayed for you. I have prayed that Satan may not sift you as we. I have prayed for you and you will follow after me and so Christ was kind of telling Peter that one day you're going to die for me right and so when Jesus asks you do you love me more than these many times Christ will ask us do you love me more than the blessings do you love me more than all these things the price for that love the price the consequence of that love may be very steep very very steep right we may never know what it is so Peter asked Lord, but what about John? What about this guy? And, and Jesus says, If I want him to be alive, what is it to you? You follow me. What does that tell us? What's another aspect of perseverance? Perseverance is individual. Perseverance is... In, that means, Blessing Chan is doing ministry along with work. Why can't I do that? 
I don't need to. God is calling you for full time ministry. Maybe God is calling you for something. Maybe God is calling me to go to some place, and I am looking at some example and saying, Lord, look at this guy. You know, he is serving you here, and here Jesus is telling me, Do you love me more than all this? Then you follow after me. Okay. The theological understanding of perseverance. How do we persevere? Let's quickly take for the next five minutes, and we will continue in the next next uh, week also. Hebrews chapter twelve. Why we don't believe in once saved, always saved is because of this particular verse. Hebrews chapter 12. Now that we know the story, we can relate to that. Hebrews 12 and verse 1. Can somebody quickly read? Uh, preferably in the... Yeah, go ahead, uh, uh, Linda, NIV. Therefore, since we yeah. are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, huh. let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. Huh. Let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. So what does it mean? Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of... Who are these witnesses? Who are the witnesses? How many of you know Hebrews chapter 11? Hebrews 11 is the statement... It's like a hall of fame of faith, right? By faith he did this. By faith he did that. And all the things about all the prophets did. And here the writer writes all... He takes the pain to go all the way. And then he says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, what is the calling? The calling is, let us run with perseverance. The race that is not for us. It is not staying with perseverance. It is not strolling. It is not relax walking with perseverance. It is running, marathon running with perseverance. What happens to a marathon runner? How does a marathon runner run? When, when there is uh, people standing with water, does he... Uh, come and stand, you know, hey, can you give me a bottle and drink the water and then run? No. How do you run with perseverance? You are always running. You are never on a break. You are always running. And how do you run? You fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith. And so here is where the writer kind of puts the theology in perspective. It is not a one-sided theology that Jesus told you will never perish, so you will never perish. It is also on our side. You fix your eyes on this person who said this. You fix your eyes on Christ who said this. And you run with perseverance because he is the author and he is the perfect. Right? It is a beautiful statement to make here because... You know, in this Hebrews chapter 11, uh, the author talks right from Seth and Abel. He starts from Abel all the way. He brings all the great heroes. But he says, don't fix your eyes on anybody. Fix your eyes on Jesus. Jesus. And run with perseverance the, the race that is marked out for us. Okay. Now, the, the, the teaching on perseverance does not start here. There is a statement called, therefore, let us run uh, you know, with perseverance. It starts off in Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 19. We find another therefore there. Hebrews 10 and verse 19. Can somebody read? Having therefore, ah. brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. Keep going. By a new and living way, mm. which he had consecrated for us mm. through the will. That is to say, his flesh. Mm. And having an high priest over the house of God, mm. let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil consent and our bodies washed with pure water. Okay, now verse 23 is the verse of perseverance. Go ahead. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith with our wavering, without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. And let us consider yeah. one another to provoke unto love and to yeah. love. We'll read that. Okay, so... What does it say here? So there is another therefore here. In Hebrews chapter 12, there is a therefore that is mentioned where, where he is talking about all the examples we have around us. All the great men of God who are around us. And he says, therefore, since all of them are witnesses to us, let us hold fast to our faith. Let us run with perseverance. But here, a few chapters before, he is talking about another therefore. What is that condition that he is talking? Whenever somebody says therefore, if you, if you studied math, you know, when you say, therefore, there's a condition on the top. What is that? He says, because Jesus has, what has he done? What has he done? He has made for us a heavenly temple. It is not a temple of Solomon. It's not a temple of earthly temple that can be destroyed by a Roman emperor or somebody can come and destroy it. Because we have a heavenly temple, because he has saved us, let us hold fast to the faith that we profess. Let us hold on to that faith because we have a heavenly temple and he has called us his own. He has saved us and made us his 
right so two reasons for perseverance one is the finished work of christ and second thing is because we have seen men of god who has persevered and who has got the reward that god has for them two reasons that not only we not only we trust god that he is faithful because here paul again says what the one who has promised is is what is faithful so what do we do so what do we do if a teacher says that don't worry esther you will pass the exam so what do we do do we study no but here what do we do christ says don't worry you are mine here paul is telling because he is faithful let us hold on let us run let us not lose hope because he is you know why he says that you know why he says that because at any point at any point in our life we can fall we can go back to fish we can fall to the grievous sins we can fall into things that we thought we can never fall into we can go back deny christ three times when we thought we will never deny christ because we are so prone to doing that here is that hope you know what happens to most christians we all start off well we all start off with a nice good stride forward we all have good ministries good anointings we we have great stuff going on suddenly something happens bathsheba is bathing somewhere and what happens what happens to king david in a moment of mistake he destroys himself right now to such people the word of god is talking because the one who promised is faithful let us continue to hold fast to the faith that we you are saying what i'm trying to say at that lowest point of your life if you have done something that you think nobody can forgive if you have done something that you think nobody can ever wash away that sin at that point of your life the writer of hebrew says let us hold on because jesus already went and interceded for us he already prayed for us because he promised and he is faithful let us not lose heart let us right perseverance means that we do our part we run we run unswervingly but we hold our trust we hold our faith in the one who can give me a miraculous catch of fish even though i went back the one who can give me the things that i that he withheld from me we believe that tomorrow is a new beginning a new mercy a new reinstatement of his calling in my life you know psalms 51 i'll close with that this this evening let's read one one quick verse and we'll we'll try to close for the evening um uh, Okay sorry two verses Hebrews 12 and uh, let's read um uh, verse 12 and 13 yes just read from 11 to 13 please Hebrews 12 verse 11 to 13 Now no chastening seems to be joyful for the present mm. but painful nevertheless afterward it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it okay Therefore strengthen the hands which hang down and the feeble knees and make straight paths for the for your feet so that what is lame may not be dislocated but rather be healed what does it say what is lame may not be dislocated, dislocated or or completely maimed but rather be you know what happens when you have a dislocated hip what happens you can't walk it hurts you are not able to do anything but are you permanently damaged no what happens when you go to the doctor doctor says close your eyes and take a deep breath count till 3 and one thing he'll give you and immediately you are healed if you don't do that what happens what happens if you are not trained by god's discipline if you don't allow god to touch us where it hurts if you don't allow god to withhold that catch of fish when god is withholding that catch of fish you know what happens to young people you know what happens to people who have been taking god for granted i can't believe god did this to me i am an atheist right this is what happens to to people who are feeble weak handed people they don't think that god is correcting me but it takes a person like john to say it is the lord who is giving me back right so here is what the the, the true meaning of perseverance is we all fall we all get dislocated we all can have mondays and tuesdays and thursdays wednesdays where we can do something completely grievous and that dislocation happens but like i told you at that moment allow god to discipline so that what may be dislocated may be healed but it may not be 
maimed or we don't become paralyzed we don't become fall away from the lord right psalms 51 is the last verse we'll read for today psalms 51 how many of you know what that psalm is do you know what psalm 51 is it is a psalm that david wrote after he committed the sin with bathsheba okay psalm 51 we'll read one or two few verses from there psalm 51 and uh, let's read uh verse 10 to 13 please Create in me a pure heart, O God, yeah. and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Mm. Do not cast me from your presence, or take your holy spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Thank you. Restore unto me the joy of your salvation, and what else? Grant me a a willing spirit, a persevering spirit, a willing spirit to sustain me. Right. this is a man who was dislocated but who is healing a man who is dislocated but he is healing he is saying lord create in me a clean heart lord how many of you have ever prayed that prayer sometimes when we do those very heinous sins that we can't believe we can stoop to that level you know we feel that this stain will never go away it, it can never go away and then you pray lord you have to create in me a clean heart because i can never forget this sin right and that's how the psalm begins this david says my sin is always before me i can't forget it and here david says create in me a clean heart lord restore to me the joy of your salvation and give me a willing spirit to sustain me and what is the result of all this healing and restoration and perseverance verse 13 i will we'll close for today then will i teach transgressor thy ways and sinner shall be converted unto thee what is the what is the result feed my lambs you know when you preach forgiveness after being forgiven it has a special power when you preach forgiveness to a person after you have experienced his sin and you have been forgiven it has a special power that nobody else can can you know ever understand or even imagine every dirty thing that you have gone through every sin that the samaritan woman did everything that she went through everything that peter went through everything that we all go through in the darkest areas of our life that is the very place where god can use you so powerfully to minister to that one person who needs that ministry from only you can give that person that ministry here david says then i will teach transgressors your ways you know when i teach them your ways they will turn back to you because they know they have hope you forgive me lord you re- you made me persevere i am a testimony and because of my testimony that sinner will turn back to you because lord you have i can i encourage you my friends as young people sometimes sin takes a hold of us it dislocates us and it may be hurting us right but that that joy of salvation when god gives it back the 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 result of all this has to be that sinners will turn back to god feed my lambs go and do the ministry that particular ministry that god has called us to but the cause that god wants us to 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 answer to that is the message that god has for us this evening persevering means that we get forgiven we get corrected we get disciplined so first we go through a season where god withholds blessings then god disciplines us god forgives us god heals us gives us a new spirit god removes that dislocation and completely heals us so that we can feed his lambs we can now tomorrow i am a food for somebody blessing is a food when somebody you know some people feed off you they will they will see you and say because he is there because i know god did something in his life because of her i know i also have hope because god can do it in his life because he he has changed that person's testimony i know i can also be changed nobody else can be that witness my friends jesus died and rose again because he rose again we believe we can live again and because we live again many people have to believe they can live again because we live again because we died because we have been as good as dead and we are still living many people around us are going to look at us and say he is the food that because of him i can live again may god help us what is the greatest weakness what is our greatest f- failure let us hold on unswervingly because the one who promised this no one can snatch us from god's hands 
no one can snatch us from god's hands christ is always waiting and when he was waiting you know sorry i don't want to continue again when he was waiting you know he said he said to peter and james and john bring some of the fish that you have caught but did he need it did he need it no when they came there on the fire there was already fish and there was bread and christ was waiting for them with all of these things right that sweet fellowship that here we enjoy right this is told i stand at the door and i knock whoever opens the door i will come in and i will dine with him and he will dine with me who has the food who brings the food no. who brings the food is it us we only open the door right Christ brings the food and he will dine with us he will share with us he will make give us that ministry that you have been praying for he'll give you the answer that you have been thinking lord i went through all this what is the answer what do i do now lord strengthen me oh lord give me that reason to go forward god will give it to us just open the door allow god to make us reinstate us create a new heart in us and restore unto us the joy of his salvation can we close our eyes together